us. Well, we're not behind you very far. Uh, I'm on the West Coast in Washington State on Whidbey Island. I'm Dr. Donna DeBonis, and today I am starting a new program for the American Association of Food Safety Public Health Veterinarians, and that is a YouTube channel and podcast. Our featured guest today is Dr. Millie Eitzen, and we are talking about the interesting pathway she's taken through her life as a veterinarian upon graduation from vet school. And um, I have a number of questions to ask you, but I thought it would be a great start if you would simply introduce yourself, talk about exactly what you're doing right now, and then we'll go back to the beginning. Which sure, actually, so. folks, we share that, that uh, beginning together, sort of, which is kind of <laughs> cool, because we both went to to the same uh, veterinary college. But go okay. ahead, Melly, please uh, tell us what you are doing right now at this point in your life. Sure, I'm retired from full-time work as a veterinary epidemiologist, but I teach once a year at the University of Vermont, MPH students, a, a class about zoonoses and climate change. So I'm actually getting ready for that. That starts next week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, that annual journey through zoonoses for, for new MPH students. Yes, I, uh, I was a little puzzled at first uh, when when I heard about the connection, but as we go through this uh, little bit of a, a story behind uh, what's what you've done with your career, um, I'm sure you could take a few minutes and tell us how that is connected as we get further down the road here. So first of all, um, let's just talk about you know the start. Uh, whatever brought you to veterinary school in the first place? I, right. I always think it's it's interesting to find out the different motivations we all had to go to vet school in the very beginning. What was yours? Sure. Well, I, I wasn't one of those typical children who grew up always thinking I was going to be a veterinarian. I, I actually didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, when I was in college, uh, I got intrigued. Well, actually, before college, when, when I was still in uh, before high school, I, I won a science fair with a with a psychology experiment. And so I got intrigued about, you know, how uh, psychology works, how our brains work. And so I thought that I was going to be a social psychologist in an academic setting and actually was enrolled in a doctoral program in, in social psychology at the University of, of Colorado in Boulder. And um, found that actually a little bit too confining and, and narrow in regards to personal and professional fulfillment. And so started looking around in my, uh, in my mid to late 20s about other options. And, um, and that's when I got intrigued by veterinary school because it was just up the road from Boulder. It was up the road in Fort Collins. So when I started thinking about veterinary school as an option, um, I was older than a lot of students applying to veterinary school because I was already, as I said, working on a PhD in social psych. So I was very thorough about my research and I, I spent quite a bit of time um, volunteering at various types of clinics. So small animal, large animal in the Boulder area. And then I spent uh, several work, weeks um, job shadowing the state public health veterinarian at the time, John Emerson, and that was really valuable. And so when I went to apply, I, I think what helped me get accepted my first time, because as you know, it's it's challenging to get accepted to vet school. Yeah, back then. Yeah. So it, it was 1979? Okay. Nine, yeah, three, women were not really in veterinary school that much right, back then. Right, our class was very small proportion of women. But anyways, I got in and, and I think because I was, I had an edge because I was more mature. I really had researched I, I know uh, those who are on the uh, acceptance committee um, want the students to have a broad idea of what you can do with a veterinary medicine degree, not be too idealistic, like locked in on James Harriet. So, so clearly I had that. Um, I, I'm sure my research background, statistics, research methodology probably intrigued some of them. So, so mm -hmm. I was able to get into veterinary school. So. Those advanced degrees that you had at that time, um, the, the fact that you had them in hand, uh, I'm positive made a big difference as well. 
uh, just coming into the veterinary curriculum, um, it is fast paced and, um, and hard pressing. So they, they wanted to make sure that anyone they admitted would handle it. And they knew you were a good candidate for that clearly based on the, the fact you had already done some vigorous uh, work in college. Right. Yes. But I so, still thought I was probably going to do clinical practice like most people. Although I must say those several weeks working with John Emerson, the state public health veterinarian. Uh, did you ever meet him? He's, he was a wonderful guy. He was just such a role model. And um, and that really intrigued me about what a public health veterinarian could do. And then when John Reif offered his uh, epidemiology class, I was just hooked. I just absolutely loved it. Talked to him um, separately. He hired me to, to be his graduate assistant on a Giardia study. He introduced me to, uh, to an EIS officer who had, who had settled in, uh, in Denver and, um, and so I, I started being really intrigued by that pathway pretty early. Well, the, what you bring up here is something that a lot of students don't think about doing uh, when they're actually in veterinary school. Prior to, you're right, there's that time you spend in the clinics and you get to know the different veterinarians at that time, usually in a volunteer situation that you go in. And, but the fact that you <clears throat> talked uh, to, your, to your college professor, met with the with the the state veterinarian and in a sense uh, did what we refer to nowadays maybe as internship kind of approach that that's huge and and back then I, I don't recall that we were ever really encouraged to do anything like that you know just stick your notice to the grindstone plug through it um, but the fact that you really spent that time to interact with uh, the different, people that were already in the field of veterinary medicine, the specific field that you were interested in, made a big difference. And this opened up doors for you. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it, uh, it, it, was, it was critical that establishing that relationship with John Reif during veterinary school, because as you said, when you're one of, I think my class was 132, when you're one of 132 students and you're just struggling to keep going and, and veterinary school is very challenging. It was for me too. There's a whole lot to memorize. and. Uh, and but you know anything that you can do to make yourself stand out um and then back then um i don't know if it was the same for you it was probably the same for you back then but during our senior year of veterinary school um, there wasn't room for all of us at the same time in the veterinary teaching hospital as seniors and so we had two trimesters in the veterinary teaching hospital and one in which we were supposed to be doing internships or externships. So, so by then I was so intrigued by epidemiology that um, Dr. Reif helped me uh, get offered a, an externship at the CDC during the fall semester that I had off of my senior year. And of course those had to be approved. And frankly, veterinarians getting into public health was so relatively new particularly working for a more human oriented agency like the CDC, CDC. Mm -hmm. that James Voss, who was the person who had to approve my doing that externship, kind of approved it, but grumbled and said, you know, well, what is, what is uh, epidemiology or CDC uh, public health have to do with veterinary medicine? So he was- yeah, little... let, let, me, let me again interject here. Uh, I believe at the time, wasn't he the Dean? Right. Yeah, um, you know, we used to joke about it, when people would hear the term epidemiology, they they they'd think of derm epidermiology and think that it had something to do with being a skin doctor. And um, uh, people nowadays with COVID nineteen have heard the term epidemiology um, more more often. But of course, Good point. yeah, the, the way I think of it is that you're a doctor for the population instead of for individual patients. So you're still trying to figure out what's going on, what's making people sick, you know, why, how can you control it? How can you treat it? How can you prevent it? But you're doing that for a population, a group of people instead of individuals. And, and the, but because you're doing it for a group of people, it requires a special set of skills um, particularly in designing research studies and interpreting those studies with statistics. And so I, I was lucky that I got those skills first applied to social psychology when I was in grad mm -hmm. school. And, and they pr 
pretty much carried over um, to studying diseases instead of so social psychology problems. So, um, so, so, so basically, and, and veterinarians can contribute. You don't have to. Certainly, some of my career, I I concentrated on diseases that go from animals to people or zoonoses, um, mm. which it would be very logical for a veterinarian to specialize in those kinds of diseases. But but with your epidemiologic training, um, you really can tackle any any public health problem. It doesn't just have to be animal related. It's like physicians in clinical practice are as well. They're the front lines to whatever diseases are going on in animals or in people. And so you need to work with them to investigate whatever they're seeing and finding out if, if what they're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Maybe oh, there's right. yeah, exactly. And, or two, and there could be a lot more. So Yeah, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because sometimes I think that clinical veterinarians don't give themselves enough credit and they don't see how important and resourceful our organization, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians would be for them. You know, mm -hmm. they're just in clinical practice struggling along. Maybe they end up talking to an internal medicine doc veterinarian at uh, the, the lab when they turn in samples or the state veterinarian. But we are here also as an organization to provide resources for clinical veterinarians. So thank you for bringing that up and, and that you did work closely with clinical veterinarians. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'd like to know uh, at this point then, when you were, when you became, when, when you started your, your career in the CDC and became an, uh, an epidemi uh, epidemic intelligence service officer, could you tell me how that path benefited your career? Sure. Um, the e EIS program was started back in the early 1950s um, to respond to bioterrorism threats. And uh, it was created to be the shock troops for, for CDC to be able to, to hit the ground running with whatever bad might be happening anywhere in the country or in the world. And what they recruited were primarily physicians that were just finishing up their residencies, uh, young, eager, enthusiastic, bright, who wanted to spend two years doing on-the-job training, investigating mm -hmm. disease outbreaks. And so gradually over the years from the 1950s, they expanded it a little bit. Um, I, I think veterinarians were probably one of the first groups that they expanded it to, but only a little bit. So. Um, I think my class of EIS officers in, starting in 1983 was maybe 60 odd, and there were three of us who were veterinarians. So if you wanna go. Um, I ended up going um, to the National Cancer Institute in Washington, DC. Oh, I think okay. that's really interesting. What a shock. <laughs> I, I had no idea. Okay. This is like taking a really a hard right turn. Okay, right. so you're in Washington, DC. I, I because I had the um, the epi methods and statistics training, I was way ahead of my other EIS officers. Most of them are physicians who are not required for any epi training prior to getting into EIS. Interestingly, for veterinarians, they've always required us to have master's degrees before getting into EIS. So it's kind of like they want us to know more coming in because you know we're not physicians, so, yeah. right? So, um, so I was the head of the game with that training, and I wanted something that would be really rigorous um, methodologically, which cancer is. Plus, I was also trying to juggle some some personal issues. My husband worked for the federal government, and we thought he could get on with his agency in Washington D.C. While I took the assignment there, and we could have a personal life too. So, uh, so, so that's why I ended up at National Cancer Institute for my two years of EIS. Oh, that's that's really neat to to be able to have that type of an experience. And so now you're building that background even more. And it, and it's an unusual background. The, the And let me stop for a moment again. The reason you could do this is because veterinary medicine provides a broad base of knowledge Correct. that you can go in any direction. Correct. So then Correct. what happened after after the two years in Washington, D.C.? With you, 
Yeah, and, and in fact, the studies that I did with National Cancer Institute were on breast cancer and uh, pancreatic cancer in which the, the lead investigators were studying animal models. So they valued my broad mm -hmm. background. Um, plus everybody who does EIS gets to respond to outbreaks too. So I got to work on several fascinating outbreaks. Um, one related to tornadoes in North Carolina. One was a E. coli outbreak at, at a uh, EPA uh, retirement party. Uh, another one was a salmonella outbreak up in Boston. So, so it wasn't just cancer during those two years. So again, those opportunities that the EIS program gave me broadened my experience. So at the end of your EIS program, it's considered prestigious enough that that you do have lots of options for employment. And I certainly could have stayed at any number of positions in the Washington, D.C. area. But I grew up in the Southwest and I was missing it a lot. Um, those two years in Washington, D.C. Were, were something I was crazy about beyond the job at that point. So um, so the uh, they did not have at that time an environmental epidemiologist in New Mexico Health Department. And of course, there are huge environmental problems in New Mexico with, uh, with uranium and lead and in all kinds of things. And, and again, because I had a special interest in methodology, which you need to tackle those different difficult uh, environmental problems, I was and because of my EIS degree, the, the state epidemiologist in New Mexico was another EIS alum. So, of course, he trusted that training program. And so that that was my foot in the door to get hired as the environmental epidemiologist in New Mexico. There was a state public health uh, veterinarian there at the time, Dr. Rolag, uh, you know, long standing, highly respected, but he retired within a year of my getting there. And they said, well, why don't you do the state public health vet? job as well as being the state environmental epidemiologist. So, so that's the way my 12 years in New Mexico started out. Oh, beautiful country. I've been down there myself. I, I, I completely understand that and appreciate the warmth, which we're lacking over here right now in the <laughs> middle of our winter. And then, so 12 years of uh, that time period, public health, and, and what did, what did you do in terms of just a couple of highlights during that time? Sure. So there's advantages of where we do our, our, our public health work. New Mexico is a big state geographically, but a small population state, which means that um, they don't have a lot of resources to have a big public health department. So mm -hmm. even though I had the title of environmental epidemiologist and was responsible for those lead investigations, food and water outbreaks um, and and public health vet titles. So I was responsible for diseases like plague and hantavirus, um, rabies. Um, I also needed to function as a general public health uh, person and epidemiologist. So I was able to work on measles and mumps and uh, you know diarrhea and pertussis and all those things. So it was a wonderful health department to learn in for 12 years while at the same time being able to contribute to, to some, some really big outbreaks. I was in the New Mexico Health Department when hantavirus was first discovered in New Mexico. And then of yeah, course, we, we realized it was broader than just New Mexico. So that was very exciting. Um, and then you worked other agencies all through this during that time as well, didn't you? Right, like yeah. CDC we're, was called in. And, exactly. Mm -hmm. We're closely with CDC. It, it's wonderful in the Southwest being able to work with the different tribal agencies and uh, local health departments and all that. So, so it was it was very rewarding in New Mexico to be able to work on such a, a broad number of public health problems, but but also have some focus. I mean, plague. Um, New Mexico has more plague than any other place in the country. And, mm -hmm. and so um, I was particularly able to specialize in studies of cat plague and how cats are a, a risk factor for humans getting exposed. And so got to do a number of, of studies uh, about that. So it, it was a great time in New Mexico. Oh, that's, that sounds so exciting. At, at that point, uh, it sounds like you were very comfortable and enjoying yourself. So you, you said 12 years. Well, what happened that made you move on or do something different? Um, 
again, just kind of intrigued about maybe a different direction. I was very involved in New Mexico. Fortunately, New Mexico uh, was a very enlightened health department and encouraged me to be involved in academia and teaching as well as in national groups. So I was very involved in the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians, the uh, American Association of Public Health Veterinarians, which is one of the original groups that formed uh, AASPHA. Yeah, that's the right. predecessor for us. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was involved in a, with CST, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. So I was involved in a number of national groups able to serve on um, NASPHV compendia committee. So those are the national committees where people get together once a year and develop national guidelines for rabies. Uh, sure. I, I was one of the first people to, I, well, I served on the rabies one and then I was one of the first ones to to form and head up the, the one on psittacosis, the National Guidelines of Psittacosis, and then the ones on animal contact. And so I really got to know the other state public health veterinarians and CDC liaisons through that national work. And I, I was impressed that the state public health veterinarian in New York, Dr. Jack Debbie, um, had such incredible resources, and he was he was particularly able to do a lot of leadership on rabies because of the uh, the resources and the specialization he could do in a health department like New York. So when he retired, um, they did a nationwide search for his replacement, and I applied to be the state public health veterinarian in New York, and so decided to make that big jump back to the East Coast. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. I don't think people. Uh, understand the fact that we have so many options and abilities to, uh, to, to network on very many different levels as veterinarians. And so here you were in, in New Mexico, you, you had this specific type of job at the state level. Mm -hmm. And then because of, of your uh, networking, you found out more about what was happening in depth at other states at mm -hmm. their level. And, and that's a networking and that's a, a matter of, of fact that right now th that organization exists. It, mm -hmm. the, I don't know if it's the same name, the National State Veterinary Association, something. N N NASPHV, okay. National Association of State Public Health mm -hmm. Veterinarians. Yeah, that, that one, the name has not changed, but, but you're right. That's that's a key role of, of groups like the AVMA as well. Um, the opportunity every year to get together and network um, really builds your morale for your career. So even if you've got irritations in your local job as everybody does, mm -hmm. if you can network with other people and feel like you're contributing to the broader good of public health, even beyond your own paid assignment, that, that's so motivating. Right. And, and, and again, you know, besides AVMA, which most veterinarians be belong to AVMA or, or, or something, some of their local veterinary medical association, here we have a situation that because of your very job as, as a state veterinarian, there is a national association again. And then you have the, not just the networking, but the resources and, and a broader understanding. I'm sure there was some type of, of uh, annual meeting with uh, continuing education Mm -hmm. Right. And so from from that aspect, uh, what what you gain is is, again, a very deep sense of what your resources are. Mm -hmm. I know that um, nowadays, because we have the Internet, we have our email list for our so various associations and, of course, our Facebook groups, um, we would re we reach out to each other all mm -hmm. the time. You know, what do you think of this? Uh, who knows about that? Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. Um, what would you say, did you end up doing the same type of thing amongst the state? For sure. Yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. any problem that you face in your job, somebody else is probably dealing with it at some point also. And so it's it's critical to network and, and consult with each other. And plus for the public, um, it can be disconcerting for them if, if guidelines across different states are haphazard. 
And so the more that we working at the state level can consult with each other and reach agreement, that's the purpose of these national compendia that are developed by NASPHV about rabies, psittacosis, animal contact, is to reach some consensus about the best practices and and, and then hopefully the states can, can be more in sync with each other when they're responding to these diseases. Well, I remember the rabies compendium as a uh, private practitioner in clinical medicine. Uh, I, I got that in the mail just as an add-on, I believe to, you know, because I was an AVMA member. So the, the fact is that I opened that up immediately and began to read because I can't tell you how many times I would get phone calls from, from uh, clients who weren't, well, they pet owners who were like, oh, there's a bite, you know, and what do I do? Do I have to, you know, bring my cat in or so on and so forth or an animal control officer quite often. Um, so here I am just a clinician, just, you know, in, down the street with my little sign out and, and I find myself trying to help uh, animal control officers and even uh, medical doctors who, mm -hmm. who would be calling me and uh, okay you know what does this mean do you have a rabies certificate what is what does that mean <laughs> you know you have a rabies certificate uh, you signed on this dog what does that mean and um, and so I, I I would be able to provide that kind of assistance to people even though I was just in clinical practice and and I appreciate that I want to say thank you so much for as state veterinarians for recognizing that those types of uh, guidelines were a, and are inordinately helpful mm -hmm. at, in clinical practice so around what time period was that what year what year was that that you so, went from no, uh, right. your your time in Desert 19, 1997. Yeah, 1997 was when I moved back to the, okay. moved to New York. So back to the East Coast after my two years for for EIS in the DC area. And, and New York at least is a little cooler than Washington DC. So I appreciated being a little further north. So mm -hmm. yes, and and so um, in in that time period, um, you uh, again here you are in in a, in a state that's huge has a huge population what what kept you there and for how long were you there what right. what was one highlight that happened in new york during your your time there as a state veterinarian right so new york being a big population state as compared to new mexico um has tremendous resources and and some people respect it perhaps as one of the best state health departments in the country. You know, maybe, maybe California might, might argue that, but New York is fortunate to have a really outstanding um, public health department. It it's all, almost reminds me of CDC in regards to the amount of resources that it has. And therefore, like CDC, it tends to specialize. So, so when I started with um, with New York State, I headed a whole program. So instead of being, you know, one person with multiple hats in New Mexico, I headed a program with staff. And our job was really just rabies. It was called the zoonosis program, but there was so much rabies and still is in New York that wow. that pretty much uh, kept us specializing full time. So we had a separate program, separate from my program, that just dealt mm -hmm. with Lyme disease. So even those two big zoonotic diseases, New York had enough resources to have separate programs with separate groups of staff specializing in rabies and specializing in Lyme disease. So the, the benefits of that is when you have resources like that, you can really drill down and you really can do national leadership. So uh, a highlight for me being in New York was the research that we could do about rabies control. And uh, we did a lot of research into both bat rabies and raccoon rabies. Those are the two big variants in, in New York. Um, and and groundbreaking research about um, uh, education, particularly about bats getting into bedrooms and into children's camps. We did a lot of, of development of educational materials and control processes for those group settings are particularly problematic. If you have one bat uh, flying around with a bunch of sleeping kids in a children's camp, it's a nightmare because they don't, they were asleep. They don't know if they were bitten by it. The, uh, almost 
every human case of rabies in the United States is from a bat bite because they have tiny teeth and it, the wound isn't big enough to send you to the emergency room. So, um, so there was a lot that we were able to do in New York State regarding rabies. The other big highlight was that when West Nile virus hit the Western Hemisphere, it hit New York. Sure. That's and right. So, I remember. I had horses. So we, we played a lot of leadership with West Nile. Mm -hmm. I, I set up um, a, a bird and mammal surveillance program for West Nile virus for the state. And, um, and that was so successful at giving us um, foreshadowing of where the human risk would be. In other words, the birds were dying and the horses were getting sick even before the people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you would know if you were monitoring the birds or the horses, you would know where the risk was increasing for people and therefore could do mosquito control or, or education. Anyways, our, having that surveillance centered in the health department was unusual because that's monitoring animal disease. But it was for birds, mm -hmm. wild yeah. birds primarily. So, so it Go wasn't ahead. like there was another agency that would take over, over that responsibility. And so that actually, again, served as a national role model for CDC. CDC, when they saw how successful it was being in New York, very rapidly set up a nationwide uh, bird and animal uh, reporting system for West Nile virus. So, Since again, the animals are the sentinels. Right. To say this disease is right. forthcoming. Sure. So um, you had touched on very briefly that you had uh, been in some academic setting in addition to your your public health roles uh, for the state. Um, what happened? Did you continue that mm -hmm. as you as you went over to New York? And again, this is something that is that is <laughs> really common in veterinarians. Um, they they tend to have uh, more than one job. Well, so. for me, my academic jobs were never paying, so it wasn't extra income, but it was just extra um, challenges and stimulation, but, but I loved it. Maybe it's because I came from an academic background. My mother was a teacher, my dad a school librarian, but, uh, but I've always enjoyed the teaching aspect, and so I was fortunate in New Mexico to be giving guest lectures at, at the university and, and at the community college, and then um, New York, again, has been a pioneer in its partnership with the School of Public Health at the University at Albany. And the, that School of Public Health was actually started by the State Health Department. And so the original faculty members were all State Health Department employees. Um, oh, okay. Who, I had no idea. Yeah, who were donating their time to, to create this School of Public Health about 30 years ago now. And then eventually, of course, like other uh, schools of public health, they hired full-time academic faculty, but the close connection with the State Department of Health remained. And so there were a number of us, um, st still still are, uh, people who were employed full-time by the State Health Department, but also served faculty roles. And so I was able to so, do that. Uh, yeah, so w one thing I don't know that people understand is, um, is whether or not you had needed any additional type of teaching certifications or degrees. Um, what does a DVM do for you when it comes to teaching right. and college level? Well, college level teaching actually doesn't require any training in being a teacher. Um, so people get academic jobs in colleges by their knowledge of their specialty that they're going to be teaching. So, um, so certainly a number of PhD epidemiologists get hired to be at, at schools of public health. Um, but some physicians and veterinarians do as well, even some master's level people. The, the, your, your qualifications are reviewed by a faculty committee and they judge whether you've got the combination of training and experience that um, that is valuable for their faculty. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, I I taught a number of classes at the University of Albany um, semesters about epidemiology um, that weren't really related to zoonoses at all. So they relied on my epidemiology background. Um, mm -hmm. But then I also created and, and taught there for twenty years. Um, the 20 years that I was there, uh, this course about zoonoses and climate change. 
Oh, okay. So that's where that originated. All right. I, I, I didn't realize that. So again, fascinating that a, a veterinary degree and, and the experience you bring from that will uh, enable you to teach college. And at this point, um, you are in your career, you're, you're 20 years at New York. Um, what happened during that time period? And how is that in relation to the formation of, of this organization, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians? Right. So I mentioned that, that I always valued and, and appreciated that my two state health departments, New Mexico and New York, supported me uh, pr providing leadership at a, at a national level. So, so I was one of the, the ones heavily involved with the previous uh, American Association of Public Health Veterinarians. And um, there had been discussion for a number of years about uh, having public health veterinarians more formally uh, affiliated with the House of Delegates, the AVMA House of Delegates. And there's, there's, there are these associations that, that have uh, an affiliate, an official voting affiliate relationship with the AVMA House of Delegates. But public health was not one of those groups. And, uh, you know, we kind of felt like public health is in our oath, it, it's important enough to be to have actually, uh, you know, voting representation at AVMA. Um, so first, what they did is they invited us to have an honorary function. So they asked the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians to send somebody to AVMA every year to kind of be a public health consultant. But we didn't have voting privileges. And so through the work of many people over many years, they were working towards getting this official status with the AVMA. And, um, I was president of the public health side at the time that um, several several uh, strong leaders on the food safety side got together with us and said, you know, maybe if we combine forces, we could have an organization. It's very hard to get this affiliate status with AVMA. You have to have a certain number of members that are that are that are a high number of members and a high percentage of them being AVMA members, and uh, it's still a challenge to be approved, but. You know, the idea was working together, if we combine forces, maybe we can achieve this uh, official status with AVMA. And so that's what happened. And I was very proud to have been one of many who worked to, to make this happen. Um, and, and we got it to, to happen while, while I was the president of the public health side and, and, and then like along with Kelly Vest then served as, as past presidents as the organization moved, moved on into the current combined group, so. Yes, and, and in fact, um, re retaining that affiliate status uh, under the AVMA in order to have that voting rights is something that we look at every year with our membership. And our, our membership is, is uh, probably the lowest pay, paying membership you can buy anywhere. It's only $42 a year. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll join this year, maybe I won't. Well, you, you, you're important, we need you. Mm -hmm. And what um, I was able to do last year was to uh, develop a strategic partnership with uh, two other organizations, the National Association of Federal Veterinarians, those who work in a federal capacity, for example, like for the USDA, APHIS, FSIS, mm -hmm. so forth, and also the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a strategic partnership in that we combined our resources, funds, and uh, we now have a, a, a once a month uh, continuing education that is uh, for free. We, we offer this as a webinar series and to all of our members. So for $42 a year, we, we now have a very, <laughs> a, a very tangible <laughs> benefit and that's 12 credits of CE every year, which we need as veterinarians mm -hmm. to maintain our license mm -hmm. no matter where we are in order to maintain our license. No, it, it doesn't matter what level or type of practice we have. We're working for the state, the county, what have you clinical practice, we have to maintain a license in that state. Yeah. And yeah. the continuing education credit, sometimes they sneak up on you. You're like, oh my God, it's the end of the year. Do I have my <laughs> credits? So, so this is a fantastic offering. But due to your efforts and, and Dr. Kelly Vest, who 
is very much involved in and contributing to the association to this day. I know. Uh, <laughs> whatever hat he's going to wear this year. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for that, for that comment, the fact that you combine it made our, our, our association together it made it uh, much stronger. And, and it provides a precedent going forward if we may combine with any other association again, just to okay. maintain. And, and, and I want to, it's an important question. I want to ask you, what does it matter about having these voting rights mm -hmm. with AVMA? Please, please take a moment and explain why that's important and how the AVMA even affects the legislature on uh, Capitol Hill and for, right. for our, our very laws. Go ahead. Well, there's so many important animal and public health issues um, that AVMA is asked to weigh in on. And um, in the past, some people have complained that they felt that AVMA was out of touch or behind the date on things like antimicrobial resistance and, um, and, and that you know, they, they weren't recognizing public health risks from that. And, but you can't complain about something if you're not part of it. And so it's really important for public health to be at the table. If we want AVMA to be taking certain positions, recognizing public health as an important impact when making animal decisions, then public health needs to be at the table when these House of Delegates resolutions are debated and voted on. We, we need to be, you know, have an official position in regards to voting being able to meet with the with the delegates primarily who are from state state um, representing their states uh, and their districts, um, but we it's absolutely critical for us to be there, or we can't complain if AVMA is not going in a direction that we like. So anybody with any interest at all in public health, food safety, um, toxicology, any of those things. The, the dues of $42 a year are, um, are, are nothing to be able to, to be able to have the foot in the door and to be able to be at the table when these decisions are, are being discussed. Again, uh, it, it, this is affecting our laws in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is how we approach our, our lawmakers. Uh, mm -hmm. AVMA representatives very specifically are there to consult with the lawmakers so they can understand more about what is happening in regards to public health and food safety. And when I and when I mentioned, you've talked a lot about public health, but just briefly about food safety, this mm -hmm. is human food safety, again, where veterinarians are involved with that. I, I was involved as a, a member of the Army Reserve Veterinary Corps and was taught how to get in there and inspect uh, human food facilities. Mm -hmm. And that was my introduction to food safety, which turns out I love because I love food. And then I found out that pet food safety is an issue. Mm -hmm. And so these are important uh, things that we can weigh in on these issues. Right. And uh, so thank you for, for your involvement. And this again shows that, you know, any veterinarian can, can rise up within our organization and say they want to take the, a position within our organization to be, as an example, a delegate, AVMA, right. to, to, to be able to speak at AVMA right. at the, the, the different meetings that occur throughout the year. So uh, this is an opportunity, not just for you to get your continuing education, but to provide your expertise and to be part of the leadership within veterinary medicine. Right. And, and it, it is so rewarding. Anyone, it, it's so rewarding. It, most of the time it's volunteer. You're not going to get paid. Sometimes if you're attending uh, based on an organization, your travel or whatever might get reimbursed. But, but despite the fact that it's mostly volunteer work and you can say, well, I'm really busy with my paid job. How am I possibly going to do this? Um, I can't tell you how much you will appreciate doing it because again, it takes you out of yourself. You get to see the broader picture. You get to feel like you're making the world a better place. Um, it, it enriches um, whatever challenges you have in the job that you're being paid to do, so. And you're with like-minded people who, let's face it, they're movers and shakers. Mm -hmm. it, and, and this is your opportunity to get out there and be part of that. Learn leadership skills, public speaking skills, all of that, yeah. 
and, and you have support all around you, especially within our organization. We have such incredible individuals who are, are, are all part of our, our, our association. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to bring you now fast forward. You're finishing up um, the 20 years, am I correct, at New York? Okay, what, what year was that? Uh, 2017. Oh, fairly recently. Yep. Okay, now this is it. Now we, we're... <laughs> We're, we're getting into some very exciting territory. Um, 2017, you and I, uh, you know, again, we went through vet school at the same time, uh, graduated. Um, I, I was 1983, January 1983. Uh, I kind of pushed right on through that uh, summer where you could go extra if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so you're 1983 as well, correct? Right. In you the graduated. spring. Yeah. yeah. So now, we're looking at ourselves. This is coming to, okay, 2017, what are we gonna do? Um, you retired, mm -hmm. you, you retired. Yeah, actually like check mark, that's done, <laughs> I'm retired. Um, how do you face that? Right. I mean, some people, they're consumed, obviously uh, enjoyed their work, but at some point, where is it where you say, okay, I'm going to retire. What is next? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, how did that play out for you? Right. Um, for, for me, part of it just was, as, as it may have sounded, I, I certainly give, you know, 150 or 200% to whatever I'm involved in. And, and after a number of years, that can get pretty exhausting, um, particularly when you do have big big outbreaks, like when West Nile came to the United States, um, I was probably working 18 hour days from Labor Day through Thanksgiving without a day off. So, I mean, it was so scary having this new virus in the Western hemisphere. And we, yeah, some people thought that maybe if we were vigilant enough in New York that we could stamp it out and it wouldn't stretch to the rest of the country. But of course that was not possible with mosquitoes overwintering. So, um, so there's a lot of, and of course, those working in public health right now are discovering that with coronavirus is um, these things, it just yeah, these things on and happen. on and yeah. how is it going to manifest now and what's that right. going to be like? And then you, know, you have yeah. the people who are having horrific disease. This West Nile was striking people and it was, it was a horrifying, painful disease. And yeah. then you're looking like, okay, there's bird dead and I have horses. So it's like, okay, where's the vaccine? And it's, it's so on and so forth. And you're terrified that your horses are going to get it. And uh, yeah, this is, this is overwhelming in a lot of ways. I can, I can imagine just in my position, uh, let alone in yours, when you're overseeing all this and trying to decide where am I plugging holes or how do I plug holes? I, I don't even know, but, right. but, but you reach that point. And you're like, okay, I'm big breath, going to retire. Yeah. What went through your mind and how did this come about where you're an author, a published right. author? Right. What, what so, That's only a few years. What, what happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, I always love to write. And so I've written probably close to 100 scientific articles um, through my career. So I, I've always valued uh, communication through writing as, as well as teaching and, um, and, you know, being able to share your ideas um, with other people through, through writing. And so when I retired in 2017, I thought I was going to take a break from public health. I, I first started taking some courses in painting and photography and, and. Uh, oh my God, how fun you were being artistic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. I get that. Yeah. And, and I actually took two years of languages that here where I'm living in, where I relocated in Burlington, Vermont, the colleges will let those of us who are over 65 audit classes for free. So I took two years of language. I took a year of French, a year of Spanish. And so I was basically, you know, just exploring other things because I've been so consumed with public health for so many years. Um, but uh, I found out about this local writers group and thought, well, that would be fun too. I'd written a few things that were, you know, not public health related in the past. And, and so started going to this 
public uh, this writers group and actually one of the college classes I took for free was a short story course and uh -huh. and, and it was a condensed short story course at the university in the summer and you had one month to create a whole short story and present it um, to the class and get critiques and all that and I thought well if I'm going to create something pretty fast I better do it about something I know something about oh. Right. So I, I said, well, I'll, I'll write about this plague outbreak because I knew plague backwards and forwards from my years in New Mexico. So um, so I wrote the short story about, about about a plague outbreak and the college professor loved it. And he said, but it's really hard to do plague in a short story. It's too big a subject. Maybe you should think about yeah. a novel. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe do 26 of them named after different uh, zoonotic organisms. So um, I put the plague aside because I thought well, that's why you're Cinea pestis. I'll wait for a while to do that and I'll start with anthrax. And so my first novel is called Anthracis for, for anthrax, which is my background here. I love it. You know, I started um, when, when I found out that you had written this book, I went ahead and I um, bought a copy off of Amazon, so it's um, it's in my Kindle library, and and I started reading it, and uh, I was just uh, so delighted. Um, personally, I am a super nerd, and and I really like reading those medical mystery type things. I like me, I sit down and and I go through a little bit more, and I'm kind of. Oh, I'm excited. I know you haven't quite gotten the second one published, so I'm I'm taking my time reading. I'm just going, okay, I got to milk this out here. Um, but you came up with a delightful character. She is, a, you have to come up with sort of like a hero or a champion, um, but she's a very, she's a, she's a, a, a very, um, gosh, I don't know how to put it, but just an everyday kind of hero she's got her faults she's got her her strong points her challenges um so she's very very relatable i think is what i'm uh, trying to say and she's young mm -hmm. you made her young i yeah. I, really I, need, I needed to make it I needed to make her young to last through 26 novels so she's, oh, she's okay <laughs> oh, okay okay totally i get it yeah. all right yeah so very delightful tell me about um maya and Mayaverse and Dr. Ma yeah, Dr. McGuire. Okay, tell, me, tell us about, about your hero. Right. So, um, you know, they say write what you know. So certainly my character is inspired by um, my own career as a veterinary epidemiologist. And so uh, Maya, her first job is as an EIS officer, like, like it was for me. Um, she's also informed, my husband and I adopted an infant from China and uh, and so have an interracial family for that and, and are familiar with the issues that come from adoption and all of that. And so I, I, in honor of my daughter, wanted to have a heroine who was Chinese like my daughter. And you don't find that in mystery books very much. In fact, Tess Gerritsen, who's kind of the queen of, uh, of medical mysteries, medical thrillers, is Asian herself. And I saw an interview with her um, and her, her protagonists have been Caucasian, have been white. And she was asked why she didn't write, uh, you know, an Asian character like herself. And she said, because editors told her that people were not interested in having Asians as the lead for novels, that she needed to white, write white characters. And so I kind of said, well, at this stage in my life, I don't need to make a living from my novels. If I want to write an Asian heroine in honor of my daughter, who's the same age as my daughter, um, I, I'm going to do it. You know, whether that somebody doesn't like that, having an Asian heroine, I don't care. So it's an honor of her and my public health background uh, kind of combined to create uh, my McGuire, my heroine. So. Well, you know what I have to, to, to say, too, in, in reading about her pepper throughout the, the different um, scenes, um, she may have a thought or she may have an explanation to another of her colleagues about what was involved with her adoption and why that occurred and, and how she was exposed to her Chinese culture through her parents. And, and, and so I, I, again, I wanna say this, this is a multifaceted 
really a multifaceted novel. This mm -hmm. story brings up, brings up a lot of things. Dare I say it has a little romantic twist. Mm -hmm going on there yes yeah I, I thought like I noticed there was a little bit of a spark going yeah. on okay yes yeah. yes yeah I like to have uh novels be complex and have themes I mean certainly entertainment is is critical and I I say that's what I'm doing number one number two is education about these zoonotic diseases and, and the people who who solve them but my third goal is in, to be enlightening and mm -hmm. I, I want to enlighten about different things. Maya feels like a fish out of water as an Asian growing up in the Southwest. And that's how it was. I, I remember um, when we found a pediatrician for my daughter in Santa Fe, um, she was the only, like the only other Asian other than adopted kids in, in all of Santa Fe, it seemed like, you know, there, there were just no mm -hmm. other Asians at that time in Santa Fe. And, and that doctor would joke about, you know, feeling like a fish out of water. And, um, and, and so Maya feeling that way, feeling like she's been othered, you know, um, allows her to identify with immigrants coming across the Mexican border. And, right, right. And there, the risk there was, that they face. And so yeah, she, that, again, multifaceted. I, right. I mean, you, you touched on that. You also brought American Indians very quickly brought right. in the Hopi. And, right. um, and it, it, many people, uh, I am personally uh, tied to American Indians because my children are, are very small part descended from Ojibwe. And I have always had a, a vested interest in American Indians. I come from the time period of red power. So we called American Indians from American Indian movement. That said, here you are, immediately hit the ground running. We're gonna <laughs> be very multicultural in this, in this story as well. And, and the important thing is essentially you're saying, you know what, Indians are still here. They are, they have the Indian Health Service. They, they, they are, they're people just like us and they're out there trying to live and they're, they're having these different types of challenges. And, and here, the first person who is affected is a young Hopi man who passes, who I'm not gonna spoil alert anyway, he gets sick. And here we go through on how this, again, hits the ground running so fast with your novel. Um, it, it, it was never a slow slow time in pay, turning the pages that I had at all. So thank you for being so entertaining. But but then again, let's look at your whole the whole concept here. You 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 you're pretty much devoted to being an author now, mm -hmm. aren't you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I'm, it's really it's really obsessed me. I've as I said, I've continued to take college courses in creative writing and have now created um, ten short pieces for those courses and, and different workshops I've been in, primarily short stories, but also a play that was award-winning and a, and a poem. And so, um, so I spend uh, practically all, all day and night um, in writing workshops and writing. And, and right now I'm at the position of, of uh, letting people know about anthracis. I'm doing the final edits on Borrelia and I've started the first draft of Corona. So, you know, I'm juggling three novels at once at the moment, so. Yeah, really lovely. I, uh, I'm i so impressed and inspired. Um, I think that uh, as veterinarians, as we get older, there's, there's some of us who think about, okay, what else do we like to do? Personally, I'm never bored. I have so many things that, that I like to do. And, and part of what uh, I think, uh, you know, almost everyone is like, okay, I can write well for scientific reasons. Mm -hmm. Can I turn my hand to novels and make them interesting? So if anyone wants insights on their own work, um, how, how do they reach out to you? If you would right. be willing to provide that right. as a fellow veterinarian saying, you know what, this is what I got going. What do you think? Sure, I'd be glad to talk to anybody. Contact you. Right, um, I have several different emails. You can do one is just my last name, idson.millicent at gmail.com or my, um, through my website, uh, dr 
mayamaguire.com. Um, that's just another email address as well. So, and there's a contact uh, form on the on the website. So, as you, well. so your website itself has a contact right. form, and you and right. you you actually pay attention to those and answer those yourself. Right, right. Um, so people can reach me through that. They can sign up to be on my reader list, um, and and that way I send out. Uh, frequent but not overwhelming number of emails to keep people updated on, on various things going on related to zoonoses and, and creative writing and uh, so definitely I'd love to be in contact to give people any advice or if, or if they want to give me any advice of what they'd like to, to see in the novels. It is very challenging to um, turn the uh, the academic scientific information that we're familiar with into creative writing it's 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 uh it's, you make it entertaining it's yeah it's, it's a, a whole different type of writing and and you're appealing to the emotions the heart instead of the head and so um but but i've been really benefited from workshops with people who are not scientists and so they can tell me, you know, Millie, your language is too scientific. It's not appealing enough, you know, so that, so that I can, you know, try to translate it for the for the public more. And and so it's 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 challenging to reach that that balance. And I had one one friend who was a scientist, not a veterinarian, who read the novel and said she loved it, except for the. Uh, for the emotional sex themes and it's you know it's kind of like she wanted it to be more scientific and didn't want the emotional personal connection stuff but but people are people and that's what they want to read about is is how does someone who's a veterinary epidemiologist how do they navigate their life particularly for a woman um, how do you navigate your personal and professional lives how do you jive those because a lot of my female colleagues in public health never married and never had children because it is difficult to pull all that off. And so that's one of Maya's big personal challenges is um, each, does she want to pull that all that off and how is she going to do that? So that's a that's a really good point um, for sure. And the the fact that you have got this this novel out there, can you tell us uh, a, a little bit about how people can uh, get a copy of the novel, um, even sign copies, perhaps, or if you're doing any kind of um, and, and anything else to get that novel out there, uh, social right. media, like where where do we find where do we find Maya story? Yeah, the easiest place is to go to the website is kind of the central point. So, um, so just D-R-M-A-Y-A-M-A-G-U-I-R-E.com, Dr. Maya McGuire, all one word, dot com is the website. And um, on the page for this novel, I actually have direct links to the different places that you can purchase it. It's been published in four formats, ebook, paperback, hardcover, and large print. Um, so you can get oh, very good. any of those and you can get them either wide, which means through your library, your bookstore, uh, Barnes and Noble, other sites, or you can go to Amazon. It's your choice. Some people prefer one versus the other. So I have links to both in there. And um, and certainly if, if someone wants a signed copy, they just contact me and I can sign one and and, and snail mail it to them. So um so, so well, you know, there's different brilliant. options. Uh huh. Uh, you you know what I what I will do is I will put um, this information in the show notes. Certainly, the the website, how the the book can be uh, obtained in various formats. Um, the the fact that you can uh, be reached by email, um, particularly off the website, and um, I I will um, have uh, um, that that information just hitting those high points in the show notes once we upload this to our YouTube channel. And, um, and that will be in the show notes for the podcast as well, because uh, we will be doing that in addition. Um, can you tell me how important um, reviews are when, um, when you are writing these, these types of uh, fiction and in the marketing of, of it? Right, that's a big challenge I'm facing now is that even if you spend, as I did with Anthracis, two years writing and editing it and trying to get it, you know, to be as perfect as you 
possibly can. Um, still, there's a lot that's published out there. And to, to let people know and become aware, as we were just talking about, how do they become aware of it, um, in, involves marketing and promotion, which, which can be very challenging. So um, reviews is one thing that helps both uh, Goodreads and Amazon and some other sites have book reviews. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a novel like mine, without me being a famous name, won't rise up for people to see when they log on to Amazon and are looking for a book to buy. Um, my novel won't even appear in front of them as a possibility unless it gets good reviews. And that moves it up in the algorithm of Amazon to push it higher for people to find. So certainly anybody who reads um, and, and thraces and, and likes it, I, I would love to have them post some reviews because that just it's, it's not for my ego. Um, I have a tough skin, um, it, you know, as a, as a writer who's been workshopping for several years. But the, the purpose of the reviews is to basically allow the novel to be then found by somebody else. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, I mean, it, it's, it's all this work. Um, and, and obviously, you're, you're self-marketing. And, and that is a challenge in and of itself. But as your colleagues here, and again, I'll post this information about how they can uh, get the book. Um, uh, we, can, we can see about whether we want to be purchasing copies. And as I understand it, um, regardless of what platform you decide to purchase it on, you can go to Amazon, open the book and get um, a, a look and, and read a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that's as much as we all get mad at Amazon. This is actually a really great little thing where you can open the book, read a little bit and be like, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm hooked. I'm ready to keep reading. And, and that's really what I ended up doing. I, yeah. I, um, I did listen to your, uh, one of your other podcasts and, and you had mentioned that you could do that. So I, I jumped on and, and started reading like, oh, click. Okay, I'm buying that, good to go. And, and, um, and then it, it also is, um, it is kind of interesting because here you're bringing something out for people to read, but you know what? It's not just um, for veterinarians to read. Mm -hmm. when, when I was reading it, uh, honestly, because of her age, I felt like this could be um, a, a novel that a, a young person could, could read with, um, with an eye towards um, maybe they're interested in science or they're thinking they want to be a veterinarian or, or just, they're just a nerd and they're like, oh, here's a nerd book. You know, I mean, that's a, you know, a fictionalized uh, story about a disease. And, um, and, and they're just fascinated by that. Like you were, you said yourself when you were younger, when you mm -hmm. were a, a young person. And, uh, and it's, it's not just for, again, you know, one age. I, I found that when I was reading through that, I thought, you know what, this, it, this is really a universal, has a universal appeal. Would you say that you had done that on purpose or was that just like by accident? W what happened? No, I, th I like rich environments with rich characters. And so I have a broad age range of characters in, in the book. And so the, the three musketeers, the three who are most um, tied at the hip in investigating anthrax are all young, Maya in her mid-20s and the other two men that she's closest to in their early 30s. But their mentors are 40s, 50s, 60s. And they're, I like to think, in, in interesting and entertaining characters in themselves. And in fact, yes. I'm so interested in those older characters that I have some prequel stories of when they started their careers too, back in the 1980s or the 1990s. So I've got some of those as well. So um, uh -huh. yeah, so, I, so, I, yeah, I must admit, I was a little intrigued by her mentor at New York State. Right, New York City, know? New York City face or age. Yeah. yeah, so she was a bit older. So she got right. through vet school before when it was really hard to get through vet school. I mean, there were, what, maybe 10 10 female veterinarians, um, I believe in the class of 1969, which, which is where my mentor came from, Dr. Gail uh, Egan Pate. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was uh, a, a begin, uh, just kind of like 
smashed the door down and it stayed in small numbers through the 70s and and finally you know I got into vet school you got into vet school in the the late 70s and and our class got bigger and now the classes are almost entirely women mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of exciting we did such mm -hmm. a good job <laughs> and and I love, <laughs> I love the fact that you did. You you made your character really appealing and sprinkled these other characters in, and and I hope you're going to talk about the the other doctor some more because she looks right. like she's quite. Um, she, she's really got her own story. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm tough and capable. I, I like that. That's what came across to me. Is, is well, that look, at, much, look on the website. And the short stories, the, there's free short stories on the website. And one of them is the origin story for, for Faye. Um, Faye is actually the, is okay. named after one of my public health colleagues who gets a kick, to, kick out of having a character named after her. And um, anyways, her origin story is, is, I believe, one of the free stories that's on, on my website. Plus in the coronavirus, coronavirus of course is so fascinating because we've got the current outbreak, but then we had the SARS outbreak in 2003 and we had the MERS outbreak, which is continuing. And so in the Corona novel that I'm writing now, number three, I'm actually going back and having. I just paused one moment because we had a little technical difficulties. So yeah. good to hear her origin story is there, as you said. Uh, and I, I do have one final um, question. I, I mean, you've got over 20 novels that are coming up. Um, do you have them all penned out as to what you're going to write about? Can, can I ask if my favorite topic is going to be in there? Are you going to have any, are you going to have anything to do with pet food safety and exposures by any chance? Well, actually, pet foods are in the second one, Borrelia, because I talk about the um, the salmonella outbreak from the dog pig ear treats. So that that outbreak that's been going on um, Very good. Is, is in is in Borrelia. So. Ah, very nice. Okay, well, well, good to know. That's uh, that's going to be wetting my appetite for getting into the second novel. And we can expect that uh, when? I'm going to be publishing that. The, the publication process is, is daunting um, and to get things formatted and out there and everything. I'm hoping for June. Oh, very good. OK, well, well, thank you. Is there anything that you'd like to add that we may not have covered? And, and we'll kind of just circle around and, and <laughs> let you tell, tell me anything that, that uh, you know, you want, you want to mention? I guess I'd, I'd end with what I tell the graduate students that I work with. Uh, a few of them are veterinarians or end up going into vet veterinary medicine. Many of them just stop with their master's or their PhD degrees. But re regardless of, of their background, what I tell them is that, um, is to do the best that you can at whatever opportunities that come up. So you may think that you you have your life planned out and that you know what you want and that there's a straight line to that. But I, I experienced and many of others experienced uh, life as a zigzag instead, where you don't know where you're gonna end up. Certainly I would not have realized that I would end up being a creative writer, you know, writing this series on, on zoonoses. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so I think the thing to do is to um, do the very best you can, network as we were talking about, get to know people, talk to people, look for opportunities. And if something looks like a really good opportunity, but you had not thought about it before, well, consider it. Um, so, you know, take the opportunities as they come up and, and just do the very best that you can. And, and contribute and you know go out of your way to expand your knowledge and uh, and I think you can end up with an incredibly rewarding career that turns out differently than you planned it just by taking the opportunities and doing the best as, as they come along so and in, and in fact very clearly you were not tied into doing just one thing. And, and I find that young people feel that 
oh my gosh, I've got to make this big decision and then I'm going to be stuck in that. And what if I don't like it? Well, right now you're, you, you've said, hey, look at all the things that I've done. I've, I've jumped around in my zigzag um, to, to things that were appealing to me. And, and there's, again, nobody is stopping you. You, you have opportunities. And I, I appreciate so much that you've, you've ended on that note. And I, I want to thank you. I, I hope that, um, that uh, you are very successful and enjoy this time of your life. And I, I personally want to thank you uh, for providing entertainment um, <laughs> and, um, and, and something that's going to be fun to read um, all the way down the road for uh, over 20 novels. And, um, and then let's stay in touch. We've been out of touch for over 35 years, I think. Yeah. Um, so yes, we're going to stay in touch now, all right? Uh, and, um, and how can people get in touch with you on social media? Is there yeah, a I way do, of doing I, that? I do Twitter and Instagram. Um, I'm not okay. one of those that does it every day, but I'm definitely on there. For Twitter, it's just my last name, Eidson Millicent. And then on Instagram, I do my character uh -huh. and website name. So on Instagram, it's the Dr. Maya McGuire for, for Instagram, but I'm on both of those. Oh, that sounds like fun. That That's fun. So you masquerade on Instagram as Dr. <laughs> Maya McGuire. That's cool. I'm good with that. Well, thank you so much. For, for your time today you. and um, get back to work right in the next one. So <laughs> take care right. and, and, uh, and stay safe out there. Thanks. Bye. Bye.